Hello to everybody and thank you for joining us for our Craftsgiving mini series. My name is Leah and I am your moderator today. Now Craftsy, the National Quilter Circle and Creative Crochet Corner have all teamed up to provide a week of live demonstrations and a bundle of five free fall themed patterns. Make sure to download the free patterns by clicking the link in the description and once you get to the patterns page, make sure to click the picture of the project you'd like to download. Once you enter your email, you will immediately receive your free download. And of course, today is going to be some cookie decorating. So that's the picture you want to click on. Keep an eye in the chat box for a link to that as well. You can usually find it there. Now, each day this week, a new instructor is going to stream live as we quilt, sew, crochet, cook, and decorate cookies. You will get step-by-step -step demonstrations of these fun fall projects. And of course, if you have any questions during the event, that is what I am here for. Please leave your comments in the blue chat box below or in the chat on Facebook and YouTube. I'll keep an eye on those comments and ask any questions as we get to some pause points in the demonstration. Now, if there's anything specific to today's project, we'll ask those as we go, but also please, I encourage you all to leave your more general questions as well. We usually have time to get to at least a few of those before we have to sign off at the end of our time together. Now, with all of that out of the way, it is time to bring on today's instructor. We have Ann York with us today. Hi, Ann, thank you so much for being here. How are you doing today? Hey, Leah, I am doing great, and I am really excited to show everyone how to make this adorable turkey cookie platter. So is it all right if we just jump in? I would actually love for you to just start with a little preview of what we're getting into, and then we'll start in with uh, some beginning steps, and I'll start keeping an eye on the questions for you. Thank you for doing that. Yes, hello everyone. My name is Ann Yorks. I am the owner of The Flower Box and I have three wonderful classes on craftsy.com um, and they are great for beginners and seasoned decorators alike. Today's cookie project, we're going to be taking a look at how to make a really fun cookie platter. So let's take a look at what we're making. This cookie platter is made up of a series of cookies that are all overlapping on the platter to create this beautiful turkey design. And in case you're worried that you don't have these cookie cutters, you might be surprised at how easy they are to find. The body of the turkey is a number eight. The feathers are a leaf shape, or this is also a unicorn ear. It could be either, to be honest. Um, the wing is a mini leaf shape and it is, uh, I did trim off that little stem on there. And then the backside of the turkey is a scallop circle, but you can really use any cookie cutters that you might have in your bin that are similar. So maybe you don't have this exact leaf. I have a teardrop. This is a Christmas ornament and you could just trim that off or another leaf style that would also work. Um, maybe you don't have the fluted circle, but you have a regular circle for that backside cookie. So you can really get creative with these cookie shapes to create this beautiful platter. Now we are going to be working with royal icing today. And because this project is um, great for new decorators, I'd love to do a review of royal icing consistencies before we get started. Now in your decorating guide that Craftsy has put together, this is a free download that you can grab. Leah just mentioned that the icing recipe is in that guide and I encourage you to check that out. Um, it also has some step-by-step -step instructions showing each step of decorating these cookies as well. So I hope you find that helpful. But let's actually take a close look at how to make these two icing consistencies that we're going to be using today, which is the piping consistency and the flooding consistency. So I have my piping in my decorating bag with a tip number two. This is a really common cookie decorating tip. And I have my flooding icing in a icing bag without a tip. So this piping bag is thicker and this is what we're going to use to outline our cookies i call this piping icing and we also add these with the details as well in my icing bag i have a 10 second icing 
And this is what we're going to use to flow onto the surface of the cookie to get that nice flat surface so that we can pipe our details. So let me show you how to make these two common icing consistencies. I have some royal icing in here and this is straight out of the mixer. So it's pretty stiff. You can see there's not a ton of motion. And we are going to first make this piping consistency, what I'm going to use for details and outlines. So I have a, a squeeze bottle that this is just water in here. And this helps me add just small amounts of water. So I want to get to a soft peak icing consistency. And I'm just going to add about a half a teaspoon of water just to thin down my royal, royal icing just a hair. And what I'm looking for is just some slight motion with that royal icing. I compare it to soft serve ice cream, and I'm really looking for that loop that you see when you uh, give a swirl of that soft serve ice cream. That's what we're also looking for here with our with our piping icing. We want just a little bit of motion. If it's too stiff, do you see that loop starting to form there? That looks pretty good to me. If it's too stiff, it's really going to start to hurt your hand. And you can always add just a couple of drops of water just to change that icing consistency ever so slightly. So we're just looking for a slight motion and looking for it to move just a little bit and form that loop like a soft serve ice cream. Okay, so we're, we are there. Now, before I take some out and put it in my piping bag, I do want to color my icing at this point because I want my pipe and my flood to match uh, exactly. So I like to just squeeze my food gels onto the spatula, not directly into the bowl. And um, this will help me control how much color is going to be added to the icing. Sometimes if you squeeze too hard, you can overcolor your icing. So I'm just trying to get that pretty orange color. And that looks really good. That was a nice large dot of the Chef Master um, food gel. So now I have my icing colored and this icing is in that pipe, piping consistency. It has just that soft peak that's forming. And I'm just going to take about uh, a teaspoon or two. I have a piping bag with a coupler and a tip on here. And I'm just going to wrap this over glass. This just helps keep this process hands-free. And I'll just put a little bit of that piping icing into the bag. So again, this is the icing that we're going to use to outline our cookies and put the details on the cookies. That's our piping icing. But now I want to show you how to make our flooding icing. And this is the thinner icing that we're gonna to use to flow onto the surface of the cookie. So I'm gonna add about two teaspoons of water and you can measure this using a measuring spoon or you can eyeball it um, if you're comfortable doing that. Both ways work. And I'm just looking to uh, thin this down so that it flows off my spatula. And when I'm making my flood icing, I generally do two, uh, two tests. So I'm gonna add another, about a half teaspoon of icing, really just to thin this down to that flooding consistency. So now I'm gonna see if this has the flow that I'm looking for off of the spatula. And you can see it is flowing down. It's still a little bit thick. And so I'm going to add another half teaspoon of water. So at this point, I've added about two to three teaspoons of water to get to this, this point. And I'm just going to give this a good mix. This looks really good to me. So I'm just going to see if it has that flow off the spatula. And it is flowing down, which means it's going to flow onto the surface of our cookie. Now, one of the tests that you can do with your icing is called the 10 second test. And you just take your spatula and draw a line 
through that icing and that line should take about 10 seconds to disappear and flow smooth. That way you know your icing is not too thick and not too thin. So you can actually count the seconds as that icing um, flows closed. So now we have the right consistency for our flood icing and I'm ready to put that flood icing into the bag. Now this is the bag that does not have a tip on it. And I'm just gonna take the bowl and pour that icing right into that bag. And this, you can either put a bag tie on this icing bag, or you can tie a little knot at the top, which is typically how I like to do it. Just when you're all done, you, these are easy cleanup. You can just throw those away. So those, that is a review of our two common icing consistencies that we're going to be using today, the piping and the flooding. And my first class with Craftsy that I did celebrate with cookies has another great review of icing consistencies so if you're really looking to dive deeper into cookie decorating that is a good class to start with all right so now that we've talked a little bit about the um, two icing consistencies that we're going to use i am going to jump into our cookie decorating and i'll show you how to pipe and flood the cookies. So let's take a look at this little wing. Now, when I baked these cookies, I made sure that I cut them in two directions. So I cut some like this, and then I flipped some over to get them baked um, so that the wings are going in opposite directions on the turkey platter. So when I am piping, I'm using a number two tip and I like to just hold the bag in the palm of my hand and I have a finger on the coupler to help steady out my piping lines and I'm just going to touch down at the edge of the wing and I'm giving a good medium hand squeeze as I bring that piped line around the cookie. Notice I'm staying pretty close to the surface of the cookie as I do that, but I'm not dragging the tip. I want that outline to be nice and raised up so it holds back that flood icing or that, yeah, hold back the flood icing. So now that I have the cookie outlined, I'm ready to flood in and I'm using that 10 second icing and I will just actually, I call this the bump and wiggle. I like to bump that flood icing up against that outline. It really helps to conceal it and give a nice clean edge to your cookie. And then I just wiggle that icing in nice and generously to flood in that wing. Now this little mini cookie, this is um, a great first cookie to practice. When you're working on a little bit of a larger canvas like the scalloped cookie that we're using for the back of the turkey, um, I find these little motions of outlining the cookie just take a little bit of patience. And sometimes when you're outlining a cookie that has lots of scallops like this, it's okay to touch your tip down onto the surface of the cookie and turn the cookie so that you can continue piping in a way that's going to be comfortable for you. So don't feel like you have to do those outlines all with one motion. You can stop because the icing is sticky. You can just pop your tip right in there, touch that outline and keep going. Now hand pressure as you're squeezing your icing bag really helps control how much icing is coming out of the bag. And I find that I'm using a nice medium hand squeeze on my icing bags as I'm piping those outlines. Now, again, I'm going to flood in this cookie and I am just bumping that flood icing up against that outline. See how it just sort of flows over against the outline and really conceals it to give me a nice clean edge to the cookie. Um, also, because the icing colors match exactly like I just showed you how I color 
the icing that will really help um, with giving a nice good finish to your cookies when they are all dry. Now, speaking of drying, this type of icing, this royal icing, you need to allow it to set up before you add the details. So this icing is definitely still very wet. I just flooded this wing and adding details could cause some problems. Um, the colors could leach into each other and you could see some color bleeding. So I like to pop my cookies on the cookie sheet and put them in front of a fan and let them dry for about an hour before I come back and add the details. So I do have the dry cookies ready to go. And these, uh, I did pipe and flood these about an hour ago. So on this little wing, this little wing just has a cute little loop on the wing just for a whimsical detail. So I have my piping icing. This is in the light brown color. And I'm just going to use a medium squeeze as I bring those loops across the wing. And I'm really just letting that icing fall onto the cookie. Now, if you are new to cookie decorating and piping loops feels a little bit intimidating, it's okay to simplify the design. You could always just pipe a line instead of these whimsical loops, and that would still look really cute and super delicious. So it's okay to tailor the design um, to what you're comfortable doing if you are just getting started with cookie decorating. Now the back of our turkey has um, these little scallops and I actually felt that it was easier to start with the outside color first and work my way in. So um, also in your um, cookie decorating guide, that download that you can grab from Craftsy, it does have a um, icing color guide just to show you what icing colors are used on this cookie platter. So I'm gonna start adding these details using the gold icing. And I'm just gonna, again, work my way around the outside of this cookie shape, adding those scallops. And this is just kind of fun. You could also add these details if you wanted to while the cookies were still um, wet as like a wet on wet. And I'm gonna show you how to do that with the feather in just a minute. So that's our, our gold icing. Then I'm going to add our orange. And again, I'm just working those scallops around. Now, one of the nice things about this platter is with the wings included, it is 13 cookies. So it takes a baker's dozen to make this cute cookie platter. Um, which would be great if you're doing cookies as a little side hustle. It makes a great set that you could offer to your customers. Or if you're making cookies for a family or friend gathering, um, it's a nice size platter for that as well. All right, so we have our little scallops in there. I did want to make a little note about this red color. This is actually the tulip red um, and it has a lot of orange undertones and um, I really love this color for fall, Thanksgiving and holiday, um, holiday projects. Can I interject here for just a moment? We've got a question. Yeah. Perfect. We have a couple that I'm hanging on to, but one is pretty specific to what you've been showing us. So this one comes from Marsha, and I know you've given a few tips about how you keep your hands steady, but Marsha's specifically asking, what is the secret for a steady hand while decorating? So do you want to talk a little bit more about how you keep your hand and arm perhaps steady while you're piping those lines? Yeah, a lot of times I find I'm leaning this part of my hand on the edge of the table, which steadies me. And then as I'm holding that piping bag, I just keep that 
finger on my coupler and it kind of counterbalances me. Um, so that's a good start. I always like to keep my body centered and comfortable um, in front of my cookies and that helps keep me steady. And one thing that I did when I was a new decorator is I loved to do piping practice sheets. And again, with my Celebrate with Cookies class on Craftsy, it does come with a piping practice sheet. This is a sheet that you can just print and pipe on and practice lines. And just that repetition of piping lines will really help, you know, that muscle memory and just kind of steady out those lines as you continue to practice. So I hope those tips help steady out those lines. It takes a little practice. <laughs> I'm going to add one more detail on. I notice you're seated, but is there a preference standing or seated for anybody that's struggling with hand steadiness? Um, I typically do sit while I'm decorating. I think it's a personal preference. Mm -hmm. And with anything, um, when you're starting a new hobby or a new craft, I suggest trying it one or two different ways, trying one or two different recipes and seeing what's really comfortable for you and what works for you. But there's definitely people that stand while they decorate. I'm just a really tall person. So, <laughs> I, you know, decorating, if I'm standing, I'm kind of like hunching over, I would need like a tall table. <laughs> so, but yeah, you can stand and decorate. I know a lot of cake decorators do that. All right. Thank you. And for everybody watching, if you weren't here at the top of the hour, please put your comments, questions into the chat box. I'll be keeping an eye, gathering them up for other pauses. Uh, again, I'm hanging on to a few more general questions and for the end of our demonstration today. But anything that you have as you're watching that you have a question for Anne as she's taking us through, I'll try to jump in and ask Anne so that we can talk about it right in the moment. All right. Back to you, Anne. Okay. That sounds great. So so far, we've reviewed our icing consistencies, and I showed you two basic techniques, which is the piping, the outside of the cookie, flooding in, so piping and flooding, and then piping some of the details on the little mini wing and the back of the cookie. I want to show you one other really common technique, which is called a wet on wet technique. We're actually going to do some wet on wet stripes on the feather of our turkey. So if you um, see this feather, I just pulled one off of the platter here. It has a nice flat surface and it has these stripes, but if you look at the cookie, those stripes aren't raised up. They've actually melted down into the cookie. Um, and I did one here where I ran my scribe through the stripes. I actually like the straight stripes better. So that's what I'm going to show you today. And I'm going to do my leaf in the orange. And so again, I'm going to outline the cookie and I have my finger on the coupler and I'm just going to start at the point and bring that icing down around the side of the cookie. And then I'm going to go back up, touch at the point again and bring my outline around the other side. So now our cookie is outlined and I'm going to need my, um, my orange and my brown and my white. Now the key to a wet on wet technique is using our flood icing, okay? Because they're the same consistencies and it's going to melt down to create that nice flat surface. So you could even add you know, names of your friends or family members on that flat surface or things that you're thankful for. Um, so having that nice flat surface, it just gives a clean look to the cookie and also um, gives you room to add some details. So let me show you how I like to trim my icing bags. I have my full icing bag here and there is a little seam on the bag. I wanna try to keep that opening nice and round. So I just have that seam side up and then I flatten out the tip and give a slight little trim. And I find these small kid scissors from the school supplies aisle work better than a large full size scissors. So now I'm generously letting in that leaf or feather in this case. <laughs> and I'm just giving a good squeeze as I work my way up to the tip. Now, if you, this, this um, cookie platter is fun to do with children. If you are decorating with really young children, sometimes it's helpful to just outline the cookie for them first 
and then they can do the flooding in. It's almost like coloring for them. And so um, decorating with kids can be lots of fun, but with really young kids, sometimes it's helpful to do the outline for them. All right, now I'm ready to add the line. So again, I'm using my flood icing and I'm gonna add these lines while that uh, background, while this base layer is still wet. And this icing is just going to melt down and create a little flat layer. So there's our little line of brown. And then I'm going to add the two lines of white. And you can see that icing is already sort of, I say, melting into that background color to create that nice flat surface. So those lines aren't going to be raised up. They're just nice and flat. And I did these um, turkey wings in the gold, the orange, and the tulip red. But if you're looking to save time, um, you could do your turkey wings or your turkey feathers, pardon me, in just one color to simplify your color palette. So, okay, so that's our turkey feather. Let's take a look at the star of the show, the turkey uh, himself, and I'm going to bring that little body into our um, workspace here. Now, this guy, he has a little bit more details. This is sort of the feature cookie on the platter. So I, um, I'm going to get our cookie outlined. And I'm using my light brown piping icing with tip number two. And I'm just adding that outline to the edge of the cookie. It's like a wall that's just going to hold that flood icing back from sliding off the side of the cookie. Now I'm going to bump that flood icing right against the outline. And then I'll wiggle in with the rest of the flood. Now I do like to be generous with my icing because it gives a nice finish to the icing when all is done. It looks raised up and you don't see any divots or dips in the surface of the icing. So sometimes if you don't add enough icing, the surface of your cookie or the icing can look bumpy. So I flood until I don't see any cookie showing and I find that that gives me then that nice finish to the surface of the cookie. So once you have that body flooded in, you're ready to add the details. And I'm gonna start with the eyes first. Now these eyes are fun. And again, if this uh, eye style is a little bit too complicated, it's okay to just use two little black dots. So you can simplify faces to be in your comfort zone if you are just getting started with cookie decorating. There's nothing wrong with a simple face, but I'm gonna show you how to make these eyes. These are another wet on wet icing technique. So again, I'm going to be using that flood icing and I need my white and my black uh, to create this eye and I'm going to, my eyes, I actually, these were created with two dots, but I kept them really close. So they kind of bumped together. And to make this look a little silly and whimsical, I did make one of the eyes look bigger than the other. Now, when you're adding these eyes, they can definitely start to spread out. So you can plan to add them a little smaller than you think you need to. Um, and they will continue to spread out and widen as that flow sort of settles down. So that is um, that is our the base of the eye. Again, this is using my white flood icing. Now I'll add a dot of the black on the white. Again, I'm using the flood icing so that this detail stays nice and flat. We don't want the eye to look bulgy. And if you use piping icing, it's not going to uh, float flat like that. 
And then if you really want to bring this little turkey to life, you can add a tiny little dot of white in the corner of the black as a little catch light. And I always think that makes the eye look a little bit more lively. So again, this is a little bit of an elevated eye. And if you want to keep your eyes simple by just using black icing, you definitely can do so. Perfect now the beak on the turkey. Um, yes, yes. <laughs> it's a timing question, so I want to slide it in here. Okay, let's slide it in. The layers of the turkey icing. How long do you wait between each of these layers when you're adding to, so you flooded the turkey body. How long did you wait before you started to add these details in real life? Obviously it was very, yeah, and I usually wait at least an hour before adding the details because it does take a while for the moisture to leave the Royal icing and for it to set up. Now I do put the cookies in front of the fan that, Fast moving air does wonders for icing. It really helps it to set up faster and it adds a nice shine. So if you have a clean floor fan, you can clean your fan and put that in front of your cookies as they're drying. That really does make a big difference in the finish of the icing. But yes, about an hour. If you push it and do it earlier, um, you know, you could run into some problems. Your icing tips, these little metal things, they could poke through the surface of your base layer and create holes, which is never idea, ideal, or um, the icing colors could leach into each other and bleed. So you could see like fuzzy colors if you're putting white, <clears throat> excuse me, on a dark background. Um, the white will pull some of that darkness if that icing isn't really set up yet. So about an hour is is what I wait to do the details. And I usually find the amount of time that it takes to pipe and flood the cookies. I go through that process of outlining all of the cookies and flooding the cookies. By the time I flooded in that last cookie, the first cookie, about an hour has passed. And so I can start adding the details. So there really isn't a ton of downtime when you're decorating. It's kind of like a flow or a process. First you outline, then you flood, then you add the details. Um, so it does have a nice flow to it. You're not doing one cookie individually like, you know, like we're doing right here. So, mm -hmm. And then to add, to add on, but take us in the other direction, Lulu wanted to ask, how much time do you have when you're adding the wet stripes? So when you're adding that into the flood, how much time do you have before it's too late? Mm, I would say, you know, two minutes, you know, you kind of really want to get in there and get those stripes on there. If you find that your stripes are not um, melting in, let's see, let me get that wet one back in front of here. Um, so these have now melted flat. This is the one. You can always do this with your cookie and just give it a nice shake and that will really help to settle the icing. So if again, you're new to cookie decorating, you're really taking your time and paying attention and doing your best. And that's great. So don't feel too panicked. You can always settle the icing. Don't rush yourself when you're decorating. So. All right. Um, I'll hang on to the other questions that we have for another breaking point and let you move on to our next step. Okay. That sounds great. Let's add the rest of the turkey face to the cookie. So we just added the eyes. This is a wet on wet. We used flood icing for the white and then black flood icing to add the details on the eyes. I'm going to actually switch tips. So I had tip number two on my orange to do my outlines and my details, but now I'm going to switch down to a number 352 and it has a little notch or a V cut into that tip. This tip is typically used for um, leaves, okay? But it also makes a perfect little triangle for the beak on the turkey. So I have the V, it is now to the side and these points are kind of vertical and that will give me the right shape as I bump that beak right against those eyes and just pull out that beak on the cookie. All right, so now you can see it has a nice triangle shape. That's a quick way to pipe that detail 
Um, and now I want to add our little um, our little uh, what is this called? The waddle? I always forget what the little um, the little oh the snood the snood yes turkey anatomy 101 also cookie decorating and turkey anatomy the snood onto um this turkey so i'm just using that red icing and it's almost like a little teardrop as i pull that up and around across that beak now this guy is almost done i'm gonna use my gold piping icing to add some toes onto the bottom of the turkey And that is just a fun little pop of color. And then I'm going to use the dark brown to add a little feather detail up here at the top of the head. And those are just three little teardrops of icing. And then again, with the loops across the body, this just makes this turkey look nice and whimsical. And I did three on the top and i'll do four on the bottom again if loops make you feel nervous it's okay to simplify and just pipe lines across the turkey for that feather detail that wouldn't be a problem now this guy is almost done if you really want to take this turkey to the next level you can use this carnation pink um, it's a food color dust so it is um, from Crystal Colors, and it's just, uh, it's not a gel food color, it is a dust food color, and I'm using a round brush just to blush those turkey's uh, cheeks, and that just gives that turkey a really cute little uh, extra detail. So again, that's optional, but I always think those blush cheeks are so much fun. So again, that is just uh, an edible food color dust that you can use to embellish your cookies. All right. So um, now in your decorating guide, I do share a packaging um, tip as well. So I show this turkey platter in a white window cookie box. And I just noted in that guide that it is a 12 inch window box. I found this one on BRP box shop. Um, so that's one place that you can find these 12 inch window boxes that work great for cookie platters. Um, but there's probably other sources out there as well for packaging these cookies. And I think that that cookie platter um, would make a really nice gift for um, if you're going to a Thanksgiving dinner and you're bringing a hostess gift, um, bringing that box of cookies would be so much fun. Um, but I did also prepare one other way that you can present these cookies. And I'm just going to bring my little cookie platter back into, now charcuterie boards are lots of fun and I am definitely a big fan of, um, of charcuterie boards, but I am a really big fan of dessert style charcuterie boards. So I found this white board, um, actually I believe at Walmart, but I'm sure you can find these uh, style of boards at many um, of, you know, local stores that you have near you. And I've arranged my turkey platter around the um, base of this board. I did put a piece of parchment across the board just to keep the cookies sitting on the parchment paper. Um, I think it's better for the cookies. I don't know what's in this paint. I don't really want it touching the cookies. And I also don't want to leave butter marks on this cute little board. And I'll have to show you my little secret that's keeping the bottom of my turkey in place. It's a little rocher. So I just have that hiding under there. You could use uh, stacked cookies under there as well. Um, but that just keeps that propped up and from tipping over. So now I've found lots of fun little uh, treats and these all have 
uh, really pretty Thanksgiving colors that kind of go with our color palette, um, with our turkey project. So I have a little bowl of, these are English toffee peanut M&Ms, and I just love the colors of those. I have some peanut brittle as well. And of course, these colors of um, Reese's Pieces just work perfectly. Uh, I have the rest of my Rocher that I can just tuck in here. And I love using all these little prepackaged treats because you just spend so much time making your decorated cookies. Um, it's kind of nice just to add in some other things that are easy to grab. Now, these are a family favorite. Um, these chocolate-covered Biscoff, they're super delicious. And then I found some football-shaped uh, Reese's peanut butter cups. And, you know, if your family's watching football, they can grab a cookie and a Reese's peanut butter cup. And it might not even be a bad idea to have a little treat bag um, in case your guests eat too much turkey. They can grab some cookies and candy and pop it in a bag and take a treat home with us. So this platter just works really well with all these little fall co colored treats uh, wrapped around it. And we have quite a few people that have commented about being excited to make this. And a few of our viewers are going to, like you mentioned, bring this as a hostess gift. So I feel like that's a really great way. That board that you just showed us is an awesome way to add in maybe some other treats that other people bring while still focusing on this beautiful platter. Yes. <laughs> yes, I have to say these, um, these English toffee M&Ms, buy two bags because oh. um, you might be snacking a little as you're planning out your dessert board. <laughs> it's the bonus for yourself as you created everything. It is. They, are, <laughs> they are so yummy. <laughs> All right. Well, I do have a few questions. Is there anything else you wanted to touch on before we started to open it up for more uh, questions as they come in with the time we have left? No, I would just encourage you again to grab that decorating guide. It is a great resource to go with today's live tutorial. It has those step-by-step -step photos. I've included all of the different tip sizes that I'm using on the project. And so I think that would be really helpful if you jump through the Craftsy website and grab that free download. Absolutely. I highly recommend it. And also you can come back to this video as well. So it's a little hard to ice along with this only about one hour <laughs> tutorial. It's not quite enough time. So you can always come back and watch Anne's tips uh, if you're coming back to this at a later time. Uh, we're going to dig into some questions now. And the okay. first one, let's talk a little bit about the icing. Uh, let me find this question in here. So we had a couple questions about errors. <laughs> so what happens if you over flood the icing? So Brenda wanted to know, how would you fix that? Yeah, um, sometimes if you over flood the icing, it's a minor mm -hmm. over flood. And there's this little tool, it's called a boo-boo stick. It has a flat edge and you can just remove that excess flood by just kind of running that boo-boo stick along the side of the cookie and that will kind of clean things up now if it is niagara falls over the side of your cookie which hey i've done it you know it happens you get excited you squeeze too hard in that instance um if you have a flat spatula or even you could use a rubber spatula you could actually just take your spatula scrape off the icing repipe and reflood the cookie that one might not be able to be salvaged but you know you don't have to work with something that's not perfect you can always clean off the cookie while it's still wet and start over nobody's going to see what's underneath or what happened first so that's how i would fix an overflow on a cookie and it, it definitely happens <laughs> Well, I'm sure that plenty of us out there trying this could use that tip. So thank you. Uh, let's talk about bags next. So Janelle wants to know, once you've snipped the tip of the icing bags for the wings or the leaves, yeah. how do you keep the icing from drying out when it's in the bag? Yeah. So I have my little icing container. Um, this is from leftovers. <laughs> 
<laughs> from soup takeout and it just works perfect i love the size of it so but you can find these kind of containers even at the grocery store and i have all of my flood icings in here upside down so when they're in upside down they're not oozing out and getting all over the place this is how i always decorate and i just keep them all upside down in here and then once in a while you'll see um let me just grab a paper towel you'll see that there is a little bit of dried icing on the tip and so i'll just take the tip of my bag if we actually put it on the down camera you can just and i'll just clean off the tip like that that'll remove any dry icing from the tip of your bag and you are good to go Okay, and we're going to talk a little bit now about storing. Uh, we have two viewers specifically, so Joy um, and it looks like Kimberly both want to know, so can these cookies be frozen once they're frosted? And then also how long will they last? Will they stay fresh and edible? Do you recommend refrigeration or leave it out? What do you want to say about that whole storage situation? <laughs> yes. So um, the cookies, typically I will pack my cookies individually in a treat bag and in this photo in this package i do have these in treat bags you can find uh treat bags online they also sell them at uh craft you know big box craft stores in the baking aisle and so you can use those treat bags to individually pack your cookies um, if you are doing a platter like this, I would recommend making the cookies the day before you're going to bring them because you're probably not going to wrap them. And so you want them to be as fresh as possible. However, this type of cookie does freeze really well. So I will use a freezer quality bag or a freezer quality container, and I will layer the cookies into the bag or the container and put a sheet of parchment between each layer to keep butter marks from getting onto the cookie below it. Now, you can only do this once your icing is fully set up. So let's say you start decorating on day one, kind of in the morning or in the afternoon, I would then freeze on day two. You really want that icing to be fully set up. So overnight, I'll just store the cookies in the cool oven on their cookie sheet. All the moisture is leaving the icing. The next morning, you can just layer them up into your freezer container and just have that parchment between there. Now, I have um, frozen cookies up to three months. And I have found that they store very well in the freezer. Of course, you want to be careful with any funky odors in your freezer. You don't want your cookies to get broken. So you want a nice flat space that you can put them if they're in a freezer bag and not in a container. So those are things to think about. And then to prevent any icing issues when you take them out of the freezer, it's helpful to pull them out a couple hours before you need them. So I'll pull them out, I'll let them come to room temp, and then I will open the container. So I won't open the container right away because sometimes condensation can form on the cookies. So you pull them out of the freezer, just let them come to room temp for three to four hours, and then you're ready to open that bag or container up and put it on the platter. So storing cookies in a treat bag um, or in the freezer is definitely a great way to store cookies. Now, if you put cookies in the treat bag, I always recommend people eat them within two weeks of when I made them, and they're always better um, closer to the date that you made them, of course. <laughs> All right. Little note from me before I give you a few more questions. And uh, if you didn't join us at the very top of the hour and you're wondering how to get this download that Anne has referenced a few times, check the link in the description of this video. There should be a link there for you to follow. And then you just click on Anne's project and you'll give me your email to get that free download. As soon as your email's put in, you'll receive that download and you can print it out or follow it uh, if you prefer on your computer or your tablet or whatever you use, but you'll have that for your use and to look through. And like Anne says, it's really, really helpful to have that. Uh, lots of little details that I know, Anne, you mentioned that are provided in that download. So if you're looking for it, that's where to find it. Uh, you can also scroll through the chat box. Our team has dropped that link into the chat box as well, but it is in the link in the description. 
All right, that's it from me. Let's go into some more questions with the time that we have left. Uh, we have had a few viewers curious about where you got your cookie cutters. I know you said you kind of pieced them together. Would you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. So um, flowerbox.com, we do have the cookie cutters that I used in today's tutorial and you can find them there. Um, these cookie cutters are also found um, from the Ann Clark company. Um, I'm sure you could find similar cookie cutters even on Amazon. Um, so those are just a couple of locations. Um, I've seen a bunch of mini sets out in the craft stores as well. If you're looking for the mini the mini leaf. Um, I don't know where mine got. It disappeared off the toe. Oh, it's over here. This little mini leaf. Um, we also carry that in our online shop and same thing with the number eight. Um, so there's a variety of places, either flowerbox.com, um, Ann Clark carries them or your local craft store in the baking aisle also has a lot of these common shapes. Again, if you can't find something specific like the fluted circle, even a standard circle would make a great substitute. So chances are you can find common similar cutters wherever you're shopping. Okay, and then we're going to move into what we started with. So you started us off talking royal icing. We've had quite a few questions come in that have to do with the icing. So that's where we're going to pick up before we have to say goodbye. Uh, so first of all, do you, so this isn't talking about the cookies, this is just about the icing. Uh, Mariah wants to know how long you keep the icing. Do you freeze it? How do you store what you haven't used for this project, for example? Sure. So I typically like to make and color my icing the day before I decorate just to break up the process. And because I use meringue powder in my royal icing recipe, which is in that decorating guide as well, the icing is safe to store on your countertop and um, the next day, then you're just ready to decorate. All your icing colors are made. That's a time consuming part of the process and doing that the day before you decorate can really help you feel refreshed. So storing on the countertop for a day or two is totally fine but royal icing does start to separate over time. And so if you are not planning to use that icing within a few days, it is helpful to store it in the refrigerator. So let's say you have leftover icing, um, you've made all of your colors and you still have a bowl of leftover icing. I will pop that in my refrigerator for a future project and I'll plan to use that within the week. Now, sometimes you are a hobby decorator and you're not planning to decorate again in a week, but you know you're going to be making Christmas cookies. The icing also does freeze really well. Um, I find no matter how I'm storing it, whether it's on the counter, in the fridge, or in the freezer, it always stores best in the thicker piping icing consistency. So oftentimes these little flood bags, I won't keep those from project to project um, unless I know I'm needing those colors later on. But I will say that thicker icing, it just stores better and I find it's easier to use. Um, if your icing looks a little funky, uh, get rid of it. <laughs> you know, don't chance it. It might not perform well. It might not taste well. That's never good. So definitely pay attention and look at your icing. Um, if you've forgotten how long it's been in the refrigerator, that's usually not a good sign. And you want to just make it fresh and know that it's going to perform well. All right. And Kimberly has never worked with this icing before. And she was curious, could you describe what this tastes like if it's new to people out there? Sure. So royal icing is um, really fun because it does dry completely so that you can add those details, but it does have texture to it. It does have a little crunch. I always describe it as kind of like a little candy surface on the cookie. And so I like to use vanilla in my royal icing, which gives it a really nice flavor and makes it very delicious. My royal icing recipe is very simple. It is water, meringue powder, and vanilla and powdered sugar. So I love keeping the process simple, but you can add other things to your royal icing to give it a little bit of a softer bite. You can add glycerin to your royal icing and that will make it a little bit softer. 
Uh, so there are variations of royal icing recipes out there depending on kind of what your taste and texture preferences are. And again, um, there's multiple cookie decorating classes on Craftsy.com from George Ann Bell and Mallory and a bunch of other people. Um, and they share their tips and it's good to try things in a new way if this is brand new to you. So this is what I like. This is what I like to taste. This is what I like to work with. Um, but just understand that we all do like different things. All right. We're going to talk a little bit about the consistency. This goes way back to the beginning. Uh, and I, you use one of my favorite um, analogies for the piping consistency. And Marla wants to know what consistency you use for the detail piping. Do you want to review that? Sure. So in the beginning of today's tutorial, I review our piping and our flooding icing consistencies. That is what I used on all of the cookies today. So that piping icing is thicker. It's what we use to outline the cookie and pipe the details because it holds its shape. And I compare the consistency of that icing to a soft serve ice cream. So you're looking for that little loop. Uh, it has a little bit of motion to it, but it still really does hold its shape. Then you thin down icing to make that flood icing. The flood icing is what you use to flow onto the surface of the cookie that makes itself levels and gives you that nice flat surface so that you can add all those details. And I would compare the consistency of that 10 second flood icing to honey. So it's not watery, um, but it definitely still has flow and it will self level. But icing consistencies are very important when it comes to cookie decorating. And so I encourage you to take your time those first couple of times you're working with Royal Icing just to get the right consistency for decorating. All right, well with that, Anne, we're at the end of our question. So I always like to give you the floor for any final thoughts. Uh, what would you like to say to our viewers before I give us a few reminders before signing off? The floor is yours. Yeah, I would just love to say thank you to you, Leah. Thank you to the team at Craftsy for including this fun turkey platter as part of Craftsgiving. I just think that's such a wonderful idea. And I would love to encourage you guys to try your hand at cookie decorating if you're brand new. Just remember the cookies are gonna taste great. So if you're just getting started, give yourself a little bit of grace to have some fun with the projects. And just remember that these are a craft that you eat. So uh, don't stress too much about the details. Keep the holidays fun. <laughs> Well, thank you for those final thoughts. I think that's a great thing to remember too. These uh, mini series that we have, we have a lot of people trying out some new crafts. So if you are new to this, have fun uh, and does a fantastic demonstration. And like I said, you can come back and view this at any time and please get the download. That's going to be the link in the description. And remember to share Craftsy. So that's our hashtag. If you are going to be making this project or any of the projects this week, we would love to see it on social media. We would love for you to use the hashtag share Craftsy. It's fantastic to see what everyone in the community is coming up with. And then we will be back again tomorrow with the Craftsy Craftsgiving mini series continuing on at 2 p.m. Central. We will be streaming live with Robin Miller. And Robin is going to be providing a live demonstration on how to make the best roasted Brussels sprouts. So you can download the free recipe right now using the link in the description before tomorrow's event. And you can also find the entire mini series schedule in the video description. I hope you'll be joining us for more this week. Until next time, on behalf of our entire team and Anne, my name is Leah. Thank you for joining us today and we will see you soon. Happy crafting.